Julian, welcome. Uh, now, you should have been, at this time, safely installed in deepest Sussex, um, immersed in the glories of Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific, um, <laughs> which is now <laughs> happening next year. Um, yeah. But uh, instead of which, you're, well, every cloud, you're making a movie, aren't you? I am, amazingly. Yeah, I, didn't think, I'd be, I yeah. didn't think I'd be doing anything... Um, I thought I'd be sort of cooking, cooking for my children and doing homeschooling for the rest of eternity. But um, <laughs> somehow, uh, yeah, I seem to be involved in something. Like one of the first projects, I think, back, um, um, which is a, a little independent uh, film, um, which is a... I'm not too sure exactly how much I can tell, but it's okay. a, a sort of feminist retelling of the Peter Pan... Um, sort of story oh how uh, how interesting back to jm barry again back we'll, to we'll be barry, yeah. coming to that later yeah so um uh yeah so it's 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 both surreal and um and i suppose normal to kind of be working it's a it's very strange feeling bizarre um as i'm sure everyone you know everyone's desperate to get back and i, I really feel incredibly sorry for those performers and those people who are just linked with and you just rely on live entertainment yeah um because it is it's a total yeah it's a total nightmare it is wonderful how resourceful people have been though and uh, um yeah. that in itself is very touching um but um there's no substitute for the real thing there's no substitute no. for an actual audience either um, no i think that's I, i've certainly been feeling that i mean i started the pro you know started in march and april thinking you know i was kind of slightly cynical about everyone's sort of lockdown videos and here's <laughs> my version of yes you know whatever it is here's my you know masterpiece here's my you know, here's my version of sometimes assassins, you know, mm. shot mm. shot in a broom cupboard or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I, th th you know, I kind of felt then, I felt so slightly kind of shut off and it's not like I needed an audience or I needed attention or feedback actually, although all those things are lovely and I suppose part of why we do things. Mm. It's the, just the process of creating an ex process of expression self-expression that i felt really um lacking and you see audiences feed into that they the way they listen um makes a difference to how performers perform and uh, so all that is 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 very very strange um i i, I enjoyed one or two of your um your videos that um uh, you made your monochrome videos <laughs> which which actually t um, fed quite well into the kind of songs that you chose to perform at the piano yeah and i suppose so um, i've always quite liked black and white and i just think things look things look better yeah um so i kind of stayed with that but yeah i mean it's been a bit of a work in progress because i've never really um properly kind of done any home recording um i mean i've done a lot of tapes for for um you know when you audition for stuff you're endlessly especially nowadays, you're doing more of those kind of auditions, you know, where you don't meet anyone in, I in person. You, know, I you, you have to do that. Um, so I'm used to doing that, but to recording and then using, you know, a music software program, which I've never, ever done. And I have a newfound appreciation for recording engineers and, and mm. producers, you know, trying to get a good, a good mix. So that's been really, I've really enjoyed that process and enjoyed, you know, kind of j just dipping my toe into that particular Pool. I love um, the choice of songs as well. I mean, real golden oldies, um, which says something about you and your, uh, the sort of repertoire you love to sing. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I mean, uh, gorgeous songs like um, We'll Gather Lilacs and Shenandoah and Answer Me and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I like what I like to do is to take something like, you know, like, I suppose, yeah, We'll Gather Lilacs, for example, and then just slightly twist it and slightly, you know, refurbish it. Mm. Um, and um, uh, and just sort of put my own spin on it and the sort of harmonically maybe just sort of, you know, retune the harmonic engine, yeah, so to speak. Um, Which you can do my... when you're playing, when you're accompanying yourself at the piano. You can well, do I'm all. I'm playing everything, you know, I'm doing everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm playing yeah. the, you know, the guitar, the drums, I'm doing everything basically yeah. myself. Although my son, who's now um, 10, he, he's... He can, he does some of the drums for me now, which is good. Really? So we've got a kit upstairs, hey. um, and um, yeah. So we'll, I guess you know if this goes on much longer, we'll be doing a whole Van Von Trap <laughs> kind of affair. Uh, but um, yeah, so I mean, I suppose music certainly up to the seventies. You know, um, seventy. You know, there's a bit of Michel Legrand I did, and um, I was going to do. I've got loads of things on my list of things to do. Mm. Um, but you know Leslie Brickus, for example, or who's the wonderful um, orchestrator, arranger, and composer who just died fairly recently, um, Johnny Mandel. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, yeah. Um, uh, stuff that you know, stuff that's sometimes film related. Yeah. Um, you know, there's great film composers of the '60s and '70s. I don't know. There's something about that that kind of suits me and my uh, my sensibility. I suppose I really enjoy that kind of music. But it, um, as far as listening to music is concerned, because we've we've talked in the past a lot about musical theatre and, uh-huh. and classic songbook songs, but um, uh, but less about music in the broadest sense. I mean, what mm. what really rings your bells, Julian? I mean, what do you do you love when you're a listener? What do you you get most pleasure from listening? I don't listening know. You know, I curious. don't listen. I don't listen enough, really. I feel like I, I listen to the radio. Um, I listen, but I don't. I don't. I'm not so much of an active listener, and I feel like I I need to get better at that. Mm. Um, I find I really need to be in a live environment. You know, like sitting in a concert hall. Um, I really feel like I need that sort of focus. We're sitting in an opera house with uh, when opposite. your wife's performing. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. I find that classical music has been diluted so much by the kind of, for want of a better kind of phrase, the classic FM, mm. you know, relaxing, something that you put on in the background oh, well, that's, while you're having... That's you know the I mean? ultimate curse, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, um, I find that it's yeah. difficult, and it's difficult to find time in the day to, you know, put on something and just sit there and, and listen actually to listen it. instead yeah. of it being background music. Yes, exactly. And I mean, you read music at New College Oxford, where I, I've done some guest gigs actually for Probably. the opera faculty. You know, some interviews with musicians and what well, for directors. a new. Um, yeah, New Chamber Opera, it's called. Um, well, they, they, they've got quite a big opera programme there, and I mean, I've interviewed Rene Fleming there, and I've interviewed oh, wow. um, uh, directors and conductors. Um, right. um, so just to bring music alive, uh, opera alive for the students, really. Um, w- when you were studying, um, uh, presumably voice was your focus, um, it was, yeah. And what, 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 did, what did you take away from the time? And was there ever a possibility your voice might go in a completely different direction? Um, well, I knew I didn't want to be an academic. Right. <laughs> I think that was fairly okay. obvious yeah. <laughs> from, my, uh, from, the, from the quality of my work. Yeah. Um, I think I was at the sort of tail end of, of, a, of a period of time where you could get away mm. Uh, at, at university, especially at Oxford, without doing a, a huge amount of work. Mm. <laughs> Nowadays, everything's much more stringent and, you know, uh, ordered. I think there's much more um, oversight. Mm. But when I was there, you were really left to your own devices. And I, I remember doing a bit of work. Um, but I wasn't so interested in, you know, writing string quartets in the style of Mozart. I wasn't interest, I wasn't particularly interested in music musicology or history and stuff mm. like that. I mean, I, I did a dissertation for my finals on the product, the opera productions of Peter Brook, 
Oh, did you? Um, yeah, when he... Great. When he was... Um, he was the... Briefly, he was the... Uh, the director at Covent Garden um, for about two years, maybe, or a year and a half. I don't think I've ever seen a Peter Brook opera production. I've seen Yeah, there was a quite a few famous mm. productions mm. he did. I mean, I think there were some of them were real car crashes. Mm. Um, but he was a very young man, and he was given this extraordinary position. Mm. And the press really, really rallied again. He really, really, um, they hated it. You know, he, he, he got people like Dar- Dali to do, like, uh, design Salome, for uh, example. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I was, and I was able to go into the opera house and able to look at all these original sketches, wow. you know, done by Dali. And it was kind of, it was kind of cool. So that kind of area of, 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 of the, of the, of the study was quite fun, but... I suppose because I was a choral scholar, so I sang in the choir, and that was the sort of that's my way into university. Mm. Um, that uh, gave me the opportunity of touring, um, making records, um, singing, you know, in a professional capacity, which is something I'd already done really when I was a kid uh, as a chorister. But it was it it, it, it kind of gives you a window into. Um, you know, being a professional performer. Mm. And mm. I suppose I could have gone, um, continued on the kind of classical route and continued... Um, Become a to, lyric tenor. Well, possibly, or whatever, <laughs> you know, just trying to be maybe more of a classical singer. Yeah. Uh, but that would have meant another three, five, five years in a conservatoire. And I was just ready. I just needed to get out and, yeah. Yeah. and do stuff. And, yeah. you know, I, I felt really... I felt really ready to, to, you know, to be, to, to get, get going. See, seeing you in those um, self-accompanied videos makes me realise what made you so credible as the songwriter Franklin Shepherd in that, <laughs> that now famous Michael Grandage production of Merrily We Roll Along at the Donmar. Um, even the Bon Jovi haircut had its place. Um, <laughs> um, but that, that piece... Um, it, it really taps into the disappointments in all our lives. And it's so hard for me to fathom, and many people to fathom, why it failed so dismally uh, on its first mm. outing, regardless of the, um, the failings of the staging. I don't know if you've seen the Lonnie Price documentary, The Best Worst Thing That Could Ever Have Happened. Yeah, I haven't, actually. It's, I, it's I, I know, really I know, I know, I know, I've, poignant. I know people who have seen it. Really and, poignant. yeah. Um, how Prince, I did an interview with him once, and he said um, uh, that he just lost his nerve. He oh. said that was the reason it failed. He said what I did with it was too half-hearted. I just lost my nerve. Yeah. It's interesting, even someone like that, hearing that they that they suffer from self-doubt. Yes. You'd have thought that someone like that was would just sort of stick to his guns Sometime too, you know, there's always that there's always that side to, I guess, great creative, um, you know, geniuses. It's all there's always that that nagging self doubt. Is it any good? Am I just going to be laughed at? Mm. And I guess that gives the material as a humanity and a of course it a, does and, and a vulnerability. Um, I've worked with quite a few people over the years who were in that <laughs> in that original production it's mm. weird how the business kind of leads you in a in a in a way you know and you and you, and you, you pick up connections as you oh, go along it was a great cast it really it was, was an amazing cast <laughs> yes. like jason alexander um uh, 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 uh one of the callaways was in it yeah, and, um, and um, of course, we're going to both have senior moments now. Um, the, <laughs> um, the girl who played Mary, um, uh, um, we'll, th- okay. we'll think of it in a minute. I'll probably Google it while we're talking. Yeah, Google and, it. Um, and, and uh, just to avoid Jim embarrassment. Wal- Jim Walton was in... Yes. Well, Jim Walton, who played... Mike, he played Franklin. Yeah. Um, he was in a show that I did in New York... Um, there's so many, so many connections that I've had over the, over the and years. And of course, Daniel years. Evans, um, you know, who I, every, every time I see Daniel now, I'm, I'm convinced he's got a mop of curly hair. 
Um, ah. I just cannot get that image out of my head. Um, but coming back to Franklin uh, and that performance, because it was, it must have been quite an important um, move for you at that point. Uh, Jim, yeah, it was my were... second job. I, I, I didn't properly appreciate the kind of, you know, what it, what it was really. I hadn't really, I didn't know much about Sondheim. Yeah. Um, even though I'd studied music, I didn't know much about musical theatre at all. So it was a real um, journey of discovery for me. And then, you know, having the opportunity to work with him, sitting at the piano with him and, and you know, changing some stuff um, yeah. to suit me more. Fantastic. Um, it was kind of amazing to have that, um, to have that experience. I think it's, and it's also one of those, one of those pieces where, Uh, my first agent um, said to me when I started out, he said, you get very few experiences, very few chances in your career to drink at the well. Right. Meaning meaning that, you know, a lot of the work you do, <laughs> yeah. you know, there are, there are a lot of compromises, there are a lot of, you know, things that aren't so great. Well, Steve is um, so hands-on anyway when, when people produce his work. And I've just... Um, Googled, of course, Samantha Spyro is the, the name I was reaching for. Oh, um, yes, in, and, in, our, in, in that in, production. In the Dom, yeah, yeah, and Anna yeah. Francolini, the divine Anna Francolini, yeah, yeah, yeah. who should yeah. be working all the time, and I never understand why she, she isn't. Um, yeah. But, um, no, it was, it, was, it was kind of seminal. Um, you know, it, 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 it had, as you say, you were, you were drinking at the well, and Sondheim was around, and he was around for all those Dom Marks productions actually including the Mendes ones that um, follow um, uh, I, I, the other day I was um, reliving the Sondheim 80th at the proms um, uh, for the BBC um, looking mm -hmm. forward to the week and uh, checking out one or two of the the turns on that occasion um, you were one of them of course being alive um, and uh, I was trying to get across to the presenter that you know having a, an 80th birthday concert is kind of pointless in a way for some time because the, mm. the songs are so integral to the dramas mm. that they don't really ever quite work in the same way when they're divorced from it oh that's true i i would, I would definitely agree with with you um i mean for example being alive um it really is the 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 progression you know, it's 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 the product of the progression of the musical because it comes right at the end, mm. and it's the it's the it's the answer, you know, mm. to what's been gone, what's what's happened before. So it's quite difficult. So the way I did it um, was was I suppose I tried to make it a little bit more in the moment, um, and I suppose about more about Sondheim himself, I suppose, and more like. I'm still here. <laughs> mm. I'm I'm alive mm -hmm. um, yeah. and celebrating that. So I mean, it, I would not have performed it. I don't think in the way that I performed it. Um, I mean, I've never, I've never, I've never done it on stage. The way you would, would perform it in the context of no, the show, I yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. And I've got a fair amount of stick over the over the years for the way I had performed it on, you know, there. But <laughs> um, but I would say that. Um, yeah, I would I would agree with you. Um, there are not many standards that he wrote that kind of work, you know, on their own. Well, I mean, he joked once about sending the clowns and said, um, called it a medley of his hit. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, that's the point. And and seeing Judy Dench do that uh, that number yeah. in the concert, um, it yeah. it it was so different from seeing her do it in the context of the staging. Because it's the eleven o'clock number, and there's a journey yeah. to it. There's a journey to it, yeah. exactly, and, and it all feeds into it. I mean, I had to. She was on. Was she on after me or before me? But I remember having to almost physically push her on stage because she was so nervous. She said, oh. "I can't do it. I can't." Well, do the other was so a terrifying place, isn't it? Yeah, because you're in the in the sort of bull ring beforehand. You got that walk up to the to the stage, and you know as soon as you know you're then you're surrounded by people. I, I, I mean, I've always quite enjoyed it. It is it's a thrilling place to perform. The sound is often a, a, a real problem. Um, 
just because of the nature of the hall. Well, it doesn't it lend happen. itself to miking. I think that's the problem. It doesn't. It really doesn't. So words can be lost quite a lot of times, and words are so important in that in in his music. But there's a there's a electricity about um, some of those concerts there, and there certainly was that night because of the you know it's the kind of closest to a pop gig you're going to get, mm. I suppose, in a classical arena, and the energy that you know, a stand, you know, those, those, the promenaders mm. give is, is really palpable. And it and it's really, it, it was, I remember that being a thrilling evening just to watch, you know, other people do their stuff. Do their and stuff. Just the build, the build of the night was really, was really something. It's again, one of those occasions where people, you know, they talk, they still talk about it. Like yeah. They talk about merrily. They still, you know, even 20 years later, or whatever it is, or 10 years later, they still mention it as a, as a, as a highlight. Well, it was um, special. Yeah. And, and it's because the, the, the cast was so young. And again, there's something very moving about that because you see their disillusionment as they get older mm. uh, and the things they don't achieve. Well, could, well you see it before. You find out how or why it happened. Um, um, and, of course, you've done all this work with John Wilson, the problems which they have their unique atmosphere, those concerts, um, and they've become a kind of... Uh, it's hard to believe a year is going by without, A, the problems, and B, John Wilson at the problems. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, talk, talk a little about... Um, I mean, as challenges go, George in Sunday in the Park with George... Um, must be right up there. I mean, it's technically so oh, challenging. I would have thought. Yeah. Tell me about. Talk about that. You did it in Paris. I did it in Paris. At, at the um, uh, Chatelet. Chatelet, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the Chatelet. Um, uh, before it was uh, refurbished, which I think happened a couple of years ago, they were uh, they'd started doing um, a, you know a, a sequence of English musicals and trying to you know kind of bring. American English musical theatre to a wider French audience, mm. and um, they'd done a few sometimes which had gone down very well. And Lee Blakely, the, who sadly passed away not so long ago, very very young, mm. I was directing um, Sunday. He asked me to do it, and it had been. Oh, I suppose if I, if there was one piece that I, you know, really really wanted to do, one part that I really really wanted to play. Out of the whole canon of musical theatre, it's it's George. Mm. Um, so I jumped at the chance, and it was a slightly unusual situation because you only get it's more of like an opera house, so you only get sort of eight or nine shots at it. Um, right, right. But uh, there was there were many great things about it. Doing it in Paris, <laughs> yes, of course, felt like it was sort of coming home in a way for the piece. Yeah, I mean, it certainly it certainly excited a you know, a sophisticated Parisian audience Mm. um, because it is a very sophisticated piece. And I I remember the the first performance, you know, there was the the, the amazing moment at the end of the first half where, Mm. you know, the piece, the the, the painting is put together. Yeah. You know, that amazing coup de théâtre, I suppose it is. Yeah. I remember there was a gasp Mm. from the audience Um, and there was a real feeling of electricity and the stage was, I mean, the production that I thought was terrific was the one at the Menier that, that transferred with Daniel and um, yes. and Jenna, who eventually who eventually did that. And I loved that production it because it was so honest and simple, and it 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 was and very untheatrical in in a way, and um, and let the music really tell the story, and the mm. music for me is some of the most brilliant music of the 20th century. I mean, I think it, mm. it, it, it is absolutely extraordinary. And also from well, when my music colleagists, yes. yes. you know, it stands up to really great analysis. I mean, there's so much inversion and, and, um, incredibly intricate counterpoint there. Everything is connected. Well, the whole piece oh. as a piece of theatre is astonishing. Genius. And, and piece you know, if you just had that one work, um, um, you know, to, to, to convey sometimes oh. genius, um, uh, that, that would, would do it. And you mentioned the end of Act One, which, uh, you know, is, is so overwhelming. Um, but then you think, and you really genuinely don't know where this piece can go in the second yeah. act. 
And that, again, is part of the theatrical genius, the people he works with to, to come up with these ideas. And yeah. where Sunday the Park goes in Act 2 is... is even more extraordinary because it... Yeah, it, I mean, people always talk about it being a, an, an anti-climax. But no. I, I have to say, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Oh. And I think that it just takes a... It just takes a bit of a... You know, the piece takes a leap and the audience has to take a leap with it. Yes. And I think the kind of connection of it and the history... Our the, links the, to the, history. The yes, links. absolutely. Those, exactly. those, it's, it's astonishing. One aspect of the character that always um, I found very powerful, and I, you having played it, um, can perhaps share something with me. To me, it's a piece about the selfishness of making art. Um, you know, the, the idea that great artists, by the very nature of what they do, have to be selfish and self-contained. Does that... Is that something you found yourself exploring when you were doing it? Hmm. Um, I think that's. I think that's a. I think that's the nature of being an artist. Hmm. I think that um, when you have a vocation, a real passion, um, it can be really uh, all-consuming, and it's very easy to forget everything else. Yeah. And. But. If you forget everything else, then you're you you stop you stop in a way you stop in, you stop your flow of inspiration because inspiration generally comes from life. Yeah, and, and it feeds feeds back into your work, back into doesn't it? Your yeah. relationships and yeah. your children and yeah. your your parents and your you know your interaction with the world, the greater world. Was that a and challenge that, for you, Julian? Um, uh, you know. Getting married, I was, having kids. Um, I, I think it's. I think. I think the great challenge for any artist is to find a balance in their lives. Um, and I feel like um, it's taken me a while to be able to strike that balance. Yeah. Um, and I think it always and it keeps changing. You know, like here in this situation, we find ourselves in. You know, six months. You know, of not really doing any performing. Um, you know, I feel there's feelings of frustration and disconnection and um, uselessness and frustration and, you know, um, and I've tried to sort of counter that by doing stuff on my own um, and... Uh, but also concentrating and... F giving my whole self to my kids, my, you know, my marriage, my, my, mm. all the other great things I have in my life. Great. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's something that I really can understand you know, very well. And I, and I loved playing a part that investigated that really explored that and the sort of selfishness of of the artist mm. um and the, you know he you know he he just couldn't he couldn't compromise no and and um, and and of course dot the irony is that dot who is a fairly simple soul yes. um was the one that recognized it yeah. <laughs> was the it's, one that said you know we sadly we don't belong together no. because you'll never give me what i need <clears throat> Um, yes, it's um, very moving. It's a, yeah, it's a really, really moving piece and very honest. And I mean, I'd love to do it again. Um, you know, in a different guise. Whether I get the opportunity, I don't know. But I, I, I feel that you know, it's one of those roles you think, yeah, you can't, you can't play it too many times because there's so much in it, mm. and the music is so wonderful, the story, and the, yeah. But um, well, Sondheim kind of spoils us for, for so much else. But, um, but then we look at the Rodgers and Hammerstein canon of works and we realise that ultimately it's all about craftsmanship. I mean, they were both mm. geniuses. Um, mm. And I think that shows which have sometimes been regarded as popular examples of the art. Um, I always get irritated by people who say, oh, well, Rogers and Hart is the more sophisticated. Rogers and Amberstein were, you know, populists. Yeah. And it's, it's just not true. And the quality of the books, of Hammerstein's books as well, um, which is bringing me to South Pacific again, because yeah. um, uh, you get to 
perform that next year um, with Gina Beck and um, Rob Houchen. Um, very gifted young man. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, are you excited about that? I mean, for, first of all, Julian, you get two of the most spectacular ballads ever written for, for the lyric stage. <laughs> <laughs> Selfishly, you get them both. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I am. I feel, um, it, it, I mean, in a way, it's kind of the perfect musical to stage now because it's about being trapped on an island. Yeah. Being sort of in lockdown in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I hadn't thought of it that way before. That's well, interesting. It's about the isolate. I mean, he's yes. certainly an, is- an isolationist. Yes. Um, has created this life for himself. Um, it's sort of like a cage, really, a gilded cage, should mm-hmm. we say. Yeah. Um, and I think that, and that feeling of boredom that that pervades the the piece, especially for the soldiers, they're just at a loose end mm. most of the time because mm. there's no there's no action you know, until the end of the show. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I I think it's a I think it's such a fine piece. Uh, I I was really really looking forward to to you know getting my teeth in, stuck into it, but um, it will have to wait for a bit yeah. longer. I mean, you're doing the, a the music is oh. oh, it's 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 a great score. Uh, I mean, you're you're doing some bits and pieces in the the open air or in a tent down in Chichester, I gather. Um, That's right. Yeah, was that a car park? I imminent. Don't know. I'm not too sure. Yeah, it's yes. in the the gar- You know, it's in the fields outside the, the theatre. I think the, the sort right, of yeah. um, yes, that's at the end of this end of this month, which yeah, would be nice. which yeah, uh, yeah it'd be be great. And there was a video of you and and Gina. Uh, of course, the interesting thing about this show is that the 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 love affair, the the two characters, never actually sing together. Except in this extraordinary idea of twin soliloquies, where they're in their separate oh. little bubbles, um, oh, yeah. isn't that oh, an amazing it. idea? Yeah, I mean the the soliloquies just, to, I mean beautiful, beautiful pieces of music. Mm. Um, uh, there's a real tenderness to it, uh, a kind of. Um, I mean, allegedly they wrote it in sort of nine days, didn't they? Oh, something yeah. astonishing. Yeah, uh, it just feels sort of perfect in so many ways. And the book, you're right, the book is um, is really terrific. It's all well, the books are always so lean. Yeah, you know, there's the, but you know, we'll try and do it in a way that. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I kind of, I kind of have a, an inkling of what Dan wants to do with it, but f- f- speaking purely in terms of 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 um emil mm. i've always kind of associated that part with a sort of older kind of op- slightly operatic kind of mm. woofy mm. <laughs> b- bass well um, you certainly see, you, seems, you seems a bit too old yeah um there's something slightly kind of not sinister because it's not that way but it's i don't know it just doesn't I don't know, it never really turned me on, that sort of like dynamic. And I think by casting two people who are closer in age, um, it feels, I don't know, it feels more palatable in some way. Well, it, was, it was written really for a bass baritone and uh, um, yeah. with a high range. And um, so in this production, we've got two tenors. We've got you and Rob, um, right, who plays yeah. Cable. Um, I mean, uh, how does that sit with you with the songs? I mean, uh, I don't know who the MD um, is. Are they well, tr- transposing it? Uh, yeah, for... we'll do a bit of that, but not yeah. too much because you don't want to. Don't want to. You don't want him to sound younger than the guy playing cable. No, you <laughs> has to be. You do, and you've got to have some kind of age difference, and there is an age difference between me and Rob. No yeah. Difference. Oh. So oh. That's, yeah. You know. So, um, and my voice is, I think, probably a little bit heavier than Rob's. Um, so, um, that, I think that will naturally come across, but yeah, it, it, it sits a little low for me, you know, by probably about a tone. So it's not going to be shifted ma- massively, Good. There is, there'll be a little shift, Good. um, but hopefully to still retain the integrity of the, of the music. Yeah. Um, mm. but the, yeah, the songs are, ah. 
Sounds I mean, like and all of those five shows, um, you know, there isn't a duff number in any of them. And uh, to do it again and again and again, which they did, I mean, and, well, Sondheim's done it as well, um, with very, very different subjects, um, yeah. is uh, there, uh, there are very few of those around in history, in musical theatre history. Um, I did want to touch on um, a show that where we first met for our very first chat, yeah. um, a show you did at Leicester Curve with oh. Rosalie, Rosalie Craig, yeah. Um, the lovely yeah. Rosalie, who's made such a splash in the gender-reversed company recently. Yeah. Um, Finding Neverland. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, despite all the problems and the fact that it really needed and merited further work, lovely mm. score from Scott Frankel. Um, mm. I, I mean, it did felt for prey to the, <laughs> the wiles of Harvey Weinstein, didn't it? Uh -huh. um, did. God, did you ever meet him around that time? Did he come uh, to see it? Uh, he was around all the time, yeah. Was I, mean, he? I spent a year and a half on that. Was it a year and a half, maybe two years, I suppose, in total? Did a, quite a few workshops. Yeah. Um, and he was very, very hands on. Um, in more ways than one. In more ways than um, one. Sorry. Not um, me, but yes. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was. Um, well, look, there are good things about him and bad things about him. We know all the bad things about mm. him now. I mean, mm. it was fairly obvious. Anyone who worked with him, you knew that there was a monster, sort of... He was part monster. Yeah. He was, he was used to getting what he wanted. Um, mm. He was not a collaborator. He was a bully. Yeah. And... With films, you can get away with a lot because a lot of the, the creative process is behind the scenes. Mm. But for, for, for live entertainment, especially musicals, and that, this was his first foray into that area, it, it takes a lot of... Um, sometimes you have to sort of do some of the, the dirty work in public, mm. hence why you tr do tryouts. Mm. And he was unprepared for that. He was unprepared for things not to be, you know, uh, Tony Award winning. Well, he had no... At, at the first preview. He had no musical um, theatre sensibilities, it, it seemed to me. Because mm. if, you can not, if you can listen to a score like Scott's score for that, um, and, um, and then end up with a score by Gary Barlow... <laughs> um, you know, it, it says everything about your musical sensibilities, I think, uh, if you're not prepared yeah, to develop. I mean, he has, he, he has this ridiculous um, competition with Scott Rudin, um, who's this, in a way a sort of an antithesis to, to Harvey because he's a, he's a collaborator and mm. he trusts the people he employs. Mm. Um, he's a taskmaster, no doubt, and he's very, very demanding. But he knows quality and he trusts the quality mm. to do the work. Sure, he'll have notes and he'll stick his oar in if need be, but the bottom line is he employs you to do a job. Harvey would employ you and then he would fire you the next week. Mm. He's impatient and he's fickle um, and he is impetuous and impulsive and out of control. And, you know, there was so much craziness that was going on during that time that it was just... I mean, I, I almost had a nervous breakdown. I almost wanted never to do any kind of hmm. musical ever again. Um, I just didn't want to... I didn't, I, any kind of theatre. I just didn't want to do it because I felt so bullied. Uh, and so, extraordinary. Uh, well, that's an I it, it was so horrible. It was so horrible. And, and, and something that I felt... When I, when I came on board for the show and I turned down a huge amount of work during the time that I was doing it or connected to it, um, you know, I felt like it was a piece that would take me maybe into a different area of my career and be a great springboard because I thought it was a, it was a great part and mm. I felt like the material was in general really good and we had a great you know, great team behind it, great designer, great director. Um, the material was was really, I thought, stellar, stellar writing. Mm. Um, the book needed work, um, but that's 
the case for pretty much every, <laughs> every yeah, yeah. musical yeah, that's course. ever been developed. Um, you know, the book needed a bit of sharpening here and there, but that would have come in time. Of course it would. I remember um, after the matinee that I went to, David Charles Bell, who was the music director I know yeah. well, he sat down with me and he said, well, what did you think? And I said, well, my one puzzlement is there's a big duet at the end between mm. Julian and Rosalie. Um, and it doesn't belong in this score. Yeah. And he said, "Ah, oh, well, that was added quite late because Harvey decided we needed a hit single to go out, you know, yeah. to sell the show. And I said, well, there you are. You, there's the reason. Um, and, of course, you know, I guess you're talking about a very commercial animal. Um, and he ended up with a very commercial show on on Broadway, I gather, with Gary's Barlow score. But to have lost what Scott achieved, um, what you all contributed to that first outing, is a, is a, is a shame. Really, you know, it was a chamber piece. He wanted to he wanted it to be wicked, but it, it wasn't wicked. <laughs> it was it was it was a real chamber piece. And actually, the subject matter is actually quite dark. Yeah, um, such a beautiful Jay, Jay, film. It's a, great, a, it's a good beautiful film. film. It's a great film, but when you really investigate what's going on and you really knew what who Jay and Barry was, mm. it, it, it there are and what happened to the kids, mm. you know, subsequently. Yeah, there was stuff that is pretty dark and a bit sinister, and I think that um, certainly the score. There was a tweeness about some of the score, and I think that had we had a producer who was who was more of a theatre producer. Um, and then we had a book writer that was um, more of a, you know, a playwright. Then I think that we would have, we would have, we would have made something that was much more satisfying. Oh, I think so. Um, I think I thought the potential and, you know, was enormous. Oh my God! I mean, some of the music was really, really great, mm. and I, it really emotionally, I, I felt really connected to it, and I felt sorry for Scott and Michael who'd devoted so much time to it. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was a there was a there was a a plan maybe to do a like a concert version of it with a, with a, I don't know who owns the rights anymore, and I don't know what's going mm. on with those, but to try and maybe you know try and start the process again. But yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's sort of I think maybe it's gone now, and and that was just yeah, it's a one shame. of those one of those experiences. I'd I'd love yeah. to see it um, uh, given a little short lease of life as a as a concert because there's um, there's a lot there. Oh, there's some say. cracking songs. I mean there's a couple of songs for for um for the character of Sylvia, um one that's called The Change of the Seasons, another called um He Makes Me Smile, oh, yes. which I think are like you know, I think they're stellar stellar songs. Mm. Um and there are and there's some other stuff that I think is you know, there's a bit. There's a bit of. There was a first number which never really worked. We had like 15 different versions of the start of the show. <laughs> um, you know, the first number is often often tricky, but there was some other lovely, lovely, lovely mm. stuff in there. So, yeah. um, Real shame. Um, you've you've graced our TV screens in the past, Julian, with notably Fo- Foil's War, um, Michael Kitchen, who, when I was an actor in another life, he always got the parts I was up for. Huh. And if you look back at what we looked like at that time, you'll probably see why. But uh, it really used to piss me off. (laughs) He would always get the roles that I was up for because he'd done a lot more than I had. Um, And Downton, of course. Um, um, Let's talk about straight plays, um, which is a bit of a moot point in the case of My Night with Reg. Um, But um, uh, it was lovely seeing you, um, you know, in in a straight drama. Um, mm-hmm. letting go of the singing, focusing purely on your acting chops. How is it doing that for you? I mean, do, do you, um, uh, um, is, it, is it a welcome release from the, you know, the, the um, challenges mm. of singing yeah, as well as acting? So, yeah, I don't really think about it. I mean, I tend to just sort of try and do what, what what excites me and what kind of comes up and I don't really think well now's the time to do a, yeah. a musical saying yeah. that I mean I chose to do a musical this year because 
Um, I, I haven't done one for a long time and I, I really wanted to do one. But um, often it's just sort of what comes up and... and I mean, I think that the, the demands of doing a musical obviously are um, are greater, um, unless you're playing, you know, Hamlet or King Lear, because you just have to look after yourself more and conserve yeah. your energy yeah. and, and live a cleaner life. <laughs> um, um, but again, that was an experience that um, I loved. It was with, um, you know, everything aligned for that show. It was a great director, great space, great cast. Um, Kevin sadly died when we were just about to start rehearsing, I think, mm. um, which gave the the process a sort of, I don't know, there was something um, very, um, I don't know, poignant, I suppose, about it. Um, and it, it, it's a special play. It's a play that I saw in its first, you know, when it was first produced. Well, yes, I was about to say I did too. I mean, it was very. Uh, it is a, uh, a, um, a very important play in a way, um, and it's interesting. All those AIDS-related plays, when they were first mm-hmm. produced, um, mm-hmm. were a totally different experience from now, where a lot of young people um, don't even know what. I mean, they know about it, but they they weren't a part of what was happening then. No. It's a very different dynamic. Yeah, I mean, but I it's... love what I loved about the play was that it it was so uproariously funny. Yes, and heartbreakingly upsetting. Um, yeah, you know, almost in within a line sometimes. Mm. Um, and I, I, that's the kind of material that I I love. Um, I love that, you know, sort of. Dark dynamic um, didn't, didn't, uh, I was just thinking uh, I don't know why it occurred to me then didn't you do um, Buckley on Broadway with Nathan I Lane I did gosh mm. um, Nathan Lane I don't know why you see it just thought of it because I saw him at the National in um, uh, you know Angels in America, in America he said yeah. he was spectacularly good um, yeah, how he's, was he's never, he's never bad <laughs> How is it working with Nathan? Because he, he must be one of the funniest people on the planet. I would have thought so, yeah. Uh, he was a powerhouse. I, it was one of my, you know, it was a great experience for me. Um, it's just a man totally dedicated to his craft, um, steeped in it, you know. Uh, he was, um, it's like, I don't know, it's like playing tennis with, I don't know, Roger Federer or something. It's, you know, it's like the quality of delivery, mm. the quality of kind of interplay is fantastic. You're working, you know, it's, it's you're working with the top. How did it come your way? Um, I think at the time my manager in America was representing um, would it be? Michael Sheen, I think. Michael Sheen has offered it, turned it down. And then she said, oh, we've got this young actor, what do you think? And I said, oh, well, you know, if he wants to fly, fly to New York, we'll see him. So I flew myself to New York. I don't know where, I, I think I might have been in L.A. at the time. I flew myself to New York, put myself up into the, the worst hotel I've ever, <laughs> I've ever stayed in. It's one of those New York, you know, right at the end of the sort of, you know, Airbnb list. <laughs> they sort of had pigeons roosting in the wall. And... Um, I remember doing the meeting with Nathan and quite an old-fashioned producer, and it went pretty well. Um, and then they said, "What happened?" I think they Nathan. I'd said where I was staying. He said, "Oh, that's ridiculous." And then he managed to wangle me a room in some far, far nicer hotel. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I got, eventually got the job. And he was very, very. Um, very generous and very supportive and has been, you know, subsequently. And um, his, uh, his, his, that experience was, was you know, something out of trouble. Yeah. It's a great, great fun. So, uh, I mean, for, in an ideal world, I mean, we're in a chaotic world at the moment, and uh, but we have, we're all living in hope for next year and looking forward mm-hmm. and um, hoping for vaccines and all sorts of things. But in an ideal world, I mean, where would you... Where would you like to go next, or, uh, or do you not 
do you genuinely not have any idea and just go where the flow? I just flow? don't think there's much point in trying to... to <laughs> I mean, there's loads of things I'd love to do, but to try and sort of plan too much is, is pointless. And if no. this experience has taught us anything, it's like you just have to do what's in front of you and and that's it and do it to the best of your ability and yeah i mean there are i mean saying that there are things that i've 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 done in the last 6 months that i probably wouldn't have done had i been doing chichester for example yeah. um, and i will probably continue to do that um and because i find it really satisfying and fulfilling yes. um doing stuff off my own back and and certainly i have felt that need um in the last few years of my career to do more things you know where I'm creatively in control um, because I think you get to a stage as a performer where you where you just get frustrated because you see mistakes being made or decisions being made that you just would do differently and you think oh hold on I think I can do this better or I could do this in a way that you know serves the, the piece better mm. not in an arrogant way but just I think that's what comes by, by you know, with experience, and will music just, will music be uh, more likely to be a part of those plans than than um, just straight theatre? Um, I don't really know. I think perhaps certainly music, music, you know, things involving music, I, I'm drawn to. Of course, um, you know, whether it's the, whether it's a film project that has music, you know, involved in it, or whether it's a, you know, um, or television, or I mean, I've got. It's quite a lot of stuff coming out. I've got two TV shows coming out um, towards the end of this year, which which are you know a completely different um, departure for me. Um, and I'm interested in now. I'm sort of I don't know. Rather than a, you know a young man, I'm a, I'm a man now. So there are there are great there are really great parts and there's a lot well there was in, <laughs> up until the middle of March mm. there was lots of material mm. you know being made mm. and I'm, I'm sure that, that will come back and I think we're in a very exciting time with regards to, yeah. to writing especially TV writing but also plays as well mm. but I guess I you know I just try and do the best I can and I try and do you know um, things that um show my versatility I suppose and you know I like the fact that you know last year I did you know an Evo play and I did um you know was able to do some concerts um and I did two very very different you know I played a, a American porn star uh in something and then I, I did something you know I did a huge Netflix show at the end of the year um what is that? What, we, what can we look out for on Netflix? So the um, the Netflix show is called Bridgerton, which is a um, which is a sort of period drama, a big period drama produced by Shonda Rhimes, who who made Grey's Anatomy and is a big oh, yeah. sort of American American producer. So it's her first sort of dabble um, in in anything that's period. Um, so that's a that will come out towards the end of this year, and then there's a. This other TV show called Adult Material, which is an expose of the English porn industry, written by Lucy Kirkwood, who oh, wonderful, um, love her writer. work, yeah, yeah she's brilliant. So that's I think, and that's coming out very soon. Oh, and that's great. a mini series for Channel Four. So um, that was really fun to be involved. Exciting. With. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to keep it. Yeah. You know, the kind of the more the more different stuff you do, I find the the, the sort of more, the better and more interesting in your work hopefully becomes um, yeah. it would be a shame to just to be playing the same piece yeah of course every night of course well <laughs> we look forward to it all and um i look forward to a date in in chichester next year um yes i'm i'm, I'm excited about that i let's hope it's all back to a relative normality by then Julie. I, I, I have a feeling it will be yes let's see thanks a lot <laughs>